welcome. I'm I'm delighted to be able to uh, present today. Always a little bit more nervous, uh, so forgive me. Um, today, uh, I hope to be talking about the abomination of Egypt, or could it possibly be the Passover sacrifice to the Lord? Uh, we're joining here today, uh, and we're going to study the Parashat Sav, which means command. And uh, what makes this most uh, this last Shabbat so special? It's a Shabbat Haggadah. Uh, did I say that all right, Moshe? Yes, yes, that's fine. Okay. And uh, um, and so I'm hoping to embrace that thought a little bit more as I go. Uh, through these slides today, but I'll let uh, Gabriel just give a few of the housekeeping rules. Good stuff. First. Wonderful. So <clears throat> for those of you who are with us for the first time, I'll share with you uh, just the general housekeeping rules that we abide by in the Enoam discussion group that you're in today. Uh, first thing is we, we do this every week. And so we go through each Parsha reading uh, on the rhythm of the Jewish community. And we want to stay on topic because you can always talk about every other part of the, of the five books of Moses. But, you know, when we come together in the week, we want to stay on the topic. So that's that's one thing we really encourage. Um, second thing is, is we really value your participation. So uh, the idea of sitting in the background and not contributing, eh, it's not really so much part of our culture. We want everybody to contribute, at least to share some ideas. Uh, we welcome you to do that. It's meant to be an interactive environment here. Um, now, secondly, you are welcome to make references to other uh, scriptures in the Bible. You know, we're focusing on the Bible and also perhaps texts from your tradition. So today we have Christians and Jews together. And so what one thing that is important is to always preface, if you're going to share something, an idea, or just something that comes to your head that comes from another text, clarify if it's a text that is part of your, you know, uh, your faith tradition uh, or somebody else's and then you know and share the idea but again make sure it's on topic we really want to stay uh within the the realm of the discussion it's just more productive that way uh if it's a christian perspective that you're sharing be sensitive to the fact that there are other people with you that are not christians and so um it's always really uh nice to be able to share things in a way that doesn't make them feel like you're putting words in their mouth or implying that they agree with you on something and um so that's part of of what we do here so the key to that is just to clarify you know if you're a christian and if you're sharing an idea that you think is from a christian perspective you know preface it that way uh as a means of politeness and for the orthodox jews with us the same thing if you're going to pull something from the talmud that is uh completely outside of a christian's experience it's important to be able to clarify that that's the source you're referring to and that it's not something that the christian would understand necessarily or be exposed to um, but we do encourage cross-faith uh, dialogue here, and so that's part of, of, of why we do this. Um, I think that covers everything. So Wonderful. enjoy the discussion, and Dean, please go ahead. Thank you. So um, Parsha Zav, uh, let me just give you a little bit of an overview. Um, it uh, continues the laws of the sacrifices uh, began, that was begun on the previous Parsha. This is, by the way, Rabbi Sachs' uh, overview. Um, and uh, from the perspective of priests performing the ritual, rules are set out for burnt and grain offerings, sin and guilt offerings, and even peace offerings, each with its own specific procedures. Details are then set out for the induction of Aaron and his sons into office prior to the inauguration of the service of the sanctuary. But what is this Shabbat Haggadah? This is the great Shabbat before Pesach, before Passover. Um, in its historical context, in Egypt, it's the day when the Jewish people took their sheep that they would bring as their Pesach offerings. Each family would tie its sheep to a bedpost and inform the Egyptians that the sheep and the Egyptian deity would become an offering to Hashem. The Egyptians were powerless to react, but the Jews did not know that. They acted as they did because Moses told them to and because they trusted God and his prophet. Thus, the Sabbath before the first redemption was a day when the Jews showed faith and rewarded with God's protection. We read this in stone version, Chumash. So I'm sure that 
might be a little interesting, especially for some of us Christians that are with us today. But that's, let's dial down a little deeper. Um, and I want to actually take us back to Exodus chapter 8. Um, because it seems to me that it's already been referenced earlier that sacrifices to the God of Israel has the potential to offend Egyptians. Um, there really seems to be a ritual conflict between Hebrew and Egyptian beliefs during which Moses seems to have objected to Pharaoh's suggestion to hold the requested feast for the God of Israel, not in the wilderness, but in Egypt, with the argument that it would not be right to do so for the sacrifices that we offer to the Lord our God are an abomination to the Egyptians. If we offer in the sight of the Egyptian sacrifices that are an abomination to them, will they not stone us? You know, it seems that this passage suggests that Moses has already recognized that the Israelites are going to sacrifice an animal that is sacred to the Egyptians, and that this would be an abomination to the Egyptians. Perhaps because the ram was the sacred animal of two Egyptian gods, one called Amun and the other Noom, I suppose is how we pronounce it, you know, has somewhat of a uh, what you might say, a ram's head on a person. I got a little itty bitty picture there. So what's going on here? Is, is this a situation of our God is greater than your God? We're going to enslave your God for four days. We're going to actually tie it to a bedpost. Hey, we're going to ultimately roast your God. Uh, we're going to offer to our God the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of our home as a Passover offering. And you know, and, and we won't have to deal with judgment like maybe you guys will. In fact, we're going to eat your God all up with our family and our friends soberly while waiting for our deliverance that will lead to our exodus out of Egypt and out of the bondage of uh, slavery. Is Our God is going to judge false gods for the purpose of redemption. Why? Because the God of Israel wants all peoples, Jew and Gentile, to know and love him and love our neighbor. So meaning we're not just doing this for us, but ultimately we're really doing it for you too. What's more is there seems to be the ability through a very sobering time to discover some joyful worship before judgment and, and again let let's again look at this passage uh in leviticus chapter 7 verse 15 and the flesh of his thanksgiving sacrifice of well-being shall be eaten on the day that it is offered none of it shall be set aside until morning do you recognize that language there this offering is different compared to other offerings in leviticus 1 and chapter 3 it's eaten, but no leftovers are allowed after the one day of eating. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a Passover ordinance. Why? Well, Rabbi Isaac Abravanels says, can't eat it all themselves, so person who is sharing thanks needs to invite relatives, friends, and acquaintances to share in their meal and their joy in God's name will be publicly glorified. And it raises another question. You know, did they actually invite some of the Egyptians into their home? Hmm. Maybe you can take that up also in your uh, breakout rooms. But the three questions I want to leave us with before uh, I dismiss you into your breakout room is, um, what messages can be interpreted in that the Paschal Lamb offering an abomination to Egypt taking place in e is actually taking place in Egypt and not a three days journey as originally requested by Moses. Number two, was freedom from fear of Egyptian oppressors achieved for Israel? Like, did this miracle, did miracles begin? just in the process of actually taking a lamb into their home. 
And number three, is there a message for the worship of God first in your homes, our homes, as priestly families? Or do we see any relationship between even this priestly duty, sacrifice, and worship in this week's Leviticus Torah portion, Sav, and Passover? Is there something that is a challenge to us, even as families? You know, do we only worship God when we go to shul, when we go to uh, church? Or have we built an altar in our own homes? And are we offering a priestly service in our homes amongst families? And for Christians, is that something that maybe we need to recognize that has taken place in Jewish homes, not just at Passover, but throughout the week on Shabbat. Okay, we got a bonus this week. We're going to deal with elephant in the room questions. And you have your choice in your room if you want to do this or you don't want to do it. But I gave you those other three questions, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of good discussion on those. However, if you want to deal with the elephant in the room questions, and you can do it with a, uh, a sensitivity that we're Jews and Christians in the room, we're doing it, not trying to proselytize the other. We want to actually help the Jews to be stronger Jews, and we want to help the Christians to be stronger Christians. With that attitude, I think that's a qualifier to deal with these questions. Let me begin by saying both Jews and Christians see a unique Passover story as the foundation to their faith and life in the one God of Israel. Just as Passover is important to the Jewish people, hey, the Last Supper came out of a Passover for our, us Christians. So like, this is such a key time of year for both of us. And to this truth, dealing with the reality, there's been a serious enmity between both communities. That has existed for centuries. When perhaps this truth is intended to ultimately enable us to have a greater freedom to love one another conditionally. The Jewish celebration of the Exodus and the first Passover Seder ceremony kept for thousands of years makes possible for the Christian to gain greater revelation of communion with the God of Israel that was derived from a Passover called the Last Supper in our Christian tradition. The three elephant questions. Did the Last Supper with Jesus replace the first Exodus and Passover with Moses? Ooh, okay. Number two, how can Christians see their Passover story as a continuation and not a replacement to the original Jewish celebration of Passover? Some of you, if you take that question, you might get into Christian anti-Semitism. Doesn't it begin with validating the Jewish representation of Israel's history and their understanding and relationship with God and pursuing the universal application through further revelation of Israel that actually we can both serve God together, each with our own respective and distinctive role and purpose? And three, I love this one. Can thanksgiving to God be achieved because of both unique and huge historical Passovers, looking forward to a future unfolding Passover story, offering even greater freedom for the world, and a sorrow that ultimately gets turned to joy. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Mr. Gabriel, but I hope that might provide a little fodder before you go into your breakout rooms. Great. Thanks, Dean. A lot of food for discussion. For sure. <clears throat> All right, Kim, we're, uh, I think, ready to just hit the breakup rooms. Maybe I'll just get the ball rolling here. Um, I'm not sure what room we were in, uh, numerically speaking, but uh, room three? Okay. And uh, Jocelyn, myself, I'm scanning Dina, uh, Jonathan, Paul and uh, Yolanda was, uh, were in our room and uh, we were just finishing up on this idea of like fear and Paul was sharing uh, his, his, uh, his thought that good fear is 
is fear that relates to obeying God or submitting to God. And the bad fear is, is the opposite is disobedience. And that a lot of the negative culture in Egypt that we're talking, that we were just looking at, uh, played in negative fear. It is an interesting theme. So, um, does anybody from our room, just if, you know, we can start off here, uh, anybody from our room want to share like the highlight thought that, uh, yeah, Bill, we, we appoint you appoint me to share the highlight. Thought. Well, I would say right away, uh, Jonathan, uh, brought up this idea that the, um, the chametz, the yeast, uh, part of the Passover, um, ceremony, if I can call it that, uh, was actually a repudiation of a Egyptian cultural staple that yeast was part of the dietary tradition in Egypt. And so the idea of refusing to eat yeast was actually one of many forms of distancing themselves from Egyptian culture. Uh, and I thought that that was, I've never heard that. I've been, how many years, you know, um, that uh, while well, he was saying that his wife, I'm going to give her a little bit of credit. She's an archaeologist. And so she knows a little bit of some of the archaeological side of this, that the Egyptians apparently were world-class leaders in yeast uh, use. And so interesting Best enough. Bakers in the world. Yeah, and also beer. Like I know that in the there's uh, archaeological evidence that when they were building the pyramids, the workers were fed beer, uh, probably to keep them happy, uh, in the midst of their slavery. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and that's a yeast product, right? So being able to be skilled with yeast would be important in order. To, so it's it's very that was Jonathan. That's a really that uh, very illuminating. Yes. Yeah, for sure. So. Um, that's we, interesting. Yeah, we talked about a lot of other things here. Did I forget something, Dina? Did I? Is there an important point? That, <laughs> I know we talked about a lot more than that. Um, we also talked. We also got into towards the end um, the uh, this issue of fear and how underneath fear really is where your trust is. What What are you trusting? And so, part of the transition, the you know, just amazing multi layered work that god was doing with uh the israelites was to challenge this foundation of fear and a culture built built on fear in in relationship we also brought us this question like how integrated were the tribes in culturally and in terms of their their religious practices with the egyptians like how deep did that integration go and so how deep was the tearing that had to happen as the Israelite clans were being pulled out now under Moshe's leadership, they had to be, you know, kind of like brought out of Egypt. Um, and so there would be a real challenge for a people who this is what they know. This is the culture they know. These are the fear related to pagan practices. Um, the, the fear related to gods that curse and, um, and, and rule and, you know, and also like priesthoods that would serve these gods that would rule through fear. Um, that the Israelites had to shift and change at many levels, uh, not just the, you know, the, the cultural insult of killing, let's say, like the lamb, but then also for themselves that they had to deal with uh, the fear that's caused by, by deep cultural change, by deep psychological change, deep spiritual change. Um, and that, that, you know, that you'd have to deal with the issue of fear that would be up front and center, not just the fear of Pharaoh's army, but also this, you know, the existential fear, uh, that happens, know. you know, when you get ripped out of your culture, you get ripped out of your tradition, you get ripped out of your religion, you get ripped out of the philosophy that surrounds those religions, which is psychologically disturbing. Anyway, um, not to belabor that point too much, but I just yeah. want to add something that, that we didn't talk about. It just thought about it now though. Thank you, Gabriel. For all of us who who left one culture and moved to another country, or like you know making Aliyah from from New York, is the question would be then you know you can take the Jews out of Egypt, but can you take Egypt out of the Jews? And and that's a, a question that they're going to deal with for 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 many many years afterwards in the desert, etc. Well, Dina, um, I can tell you, you can take the American. <laughs> <laughs> the Jews out of America, but they all seem to gather around here, and and all the American Jews, all the Anglo's are they're all here. You can't take. It. It's a human trait, so, isn't it? The joke, but it's true. 
<laughs> well, it, 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 we, we hear, we often joke about that and we know about that, about taking the exile out of the Jew, right? So right. when the Jew makes Aliyah, he's got to go through or she's got to go through a process of getting and shedding elements of the exile. It's one thing to wall yourself off and insulate yourself while you're in exile. That's a filter that works to a certain extent, but you're still uh, impacted. And it takes a while, even after you make Aliyah, before you can really let go of the exile because you drag some of it with you. So here's... Yes, and it becomes an Israeli society a question too. For example, Russian Jews will say, when I was in Russia, they called me Jew, you know, in a derogatory way. But now that I'm, I'm in Israel, they call me Russian, you know, in a derogatory way. So it's that question of identity mm -hmm. that, that so, people have to deal with. So, so, and there's a fear that comes in. Yeah. Right. You know, Alan, I was just going to say, I, the, I've, because this relates to Dean's uh, extra credit question, which we did get into, is can you get the exile out of the Gentile? Uh, in the sense that <laughs> I think there's something interesting with that because even today we see that with the the understanding of Zionism and the return of the Jewish people to the land and seeing the Bible, seeing the scriptures, the pro prophetic scriptures, seeing the Torah through this lens of, oh, Jews living in Israel again, you know, so that you can actually think of this literal application of like, oh, God actually invited them to do that. Uh, and it's a good thing that they should be there now. You know, that challenges for the Gentiles, that challenges this idea of like, well, the Jews are perpetually in exile. So we just need to reinterpret the whole Bible in a completely spiritualized way, which then leads to, you know, some of the troubling issues of anti-Semitism. Can, yeah, can I, I, I've run into that question all the time when at work, whenever I get questions from Gentiles who are well-meaning when they ask their questions and they don't understand the concept of exile. How can you be in ex exile? We're in the 21st century, yada, yada, yada. We're, we're doing better than we've ever done before in a material sense. How can you feel like you're in an exile? Just get on a plane and go back. You know, to them, it's like a vacation. So people who, who are not linked into this Judaic thought process don't understand the concept of exile. Uh, and if you really want to go back over the last 2,000 years, what the churches did is inculcate in every population throughout Europe, North Africa, and certainly in the New World, this notion that the Jews would be permanently exiled yeah. because there was a new paradigm through, through the lens of medieval Christianity, right? So it was a shock to them when we started going back, and it was a shock to them when we became a nation. It was a shock to them when we achieved victories, and it's a shock to them that now you know, we drive the pharma, uh, you know, we lead in technology, we're winning wars. Okay. And, you know, every time we're attacked, we grab another piece of land back that just happens to map to the biblical maps. So, you know, people are not thinking biblically. They, they, they have been so secularized, despite them being either ethnically or even religiously Christian. They can't say, what it, you mean this argument goes back 3,000 years? that this exile goes back 3,000 years and, and we're still talking about it, we're still dealing with it. They, they intellectually rebel against this notion that this template for history was laid out by Hashem and we have to deal with those ramifications in order to overcome it. So that's biblical thinking. When you start thinking like Hashem, when you start thinking like the Bible, it's a different thought process than what secular History Absolutely. and secular teaching will Absolutely. normally give you. Absolutely. In short words, exile isn't a relocation. Exile is really, or the, the people of Israel are returning not only to the land, they're returning to history, and they're returning to destiny. Mm -hmm. That's the, the way to look at it. Right. Beautiful. Yeah. Returning to purpose. You know, there was returning one... There, there was one last thought, uh, Eve, I'm going to pass it on in just one second. I just wanted to wrap yeah, up. Probably. For me, what's really cool was this. So, for example, if you look at the yeast, so the commandment to leave the yeast uh, for Passover and then the, connecting that with the Christian, you know, experience of looking at Passover in a spiritualized way where we're not, you know, called to making an exodus to, you know, a physical land. 
but this idea that if you put it in context, think about these Jews that were following Jesus that then go up to uh, Turkey, modern day Turkey, Asia back then, all these people are worshiping gods in pagan temples. They're pouring blood on themselves. They're having sex with temple prostitutes. They're murdering their children. They're doing all kinds of unspeakable things that, you know, that anyone who reads, you know, the book, the laws of Moses and then reads the prophets goes like, listen, I mean, this is, this culture has got to be challenged. You know, so now all of a sudden when you see like the confrontation of Passover for Gentiles, where it's like you need to make an exodus, you know, out of this uh, world. And that that was a confrontation that was really happening, you know, in, in the early days of the Christian church. People were being called out of their own pagan Egypt-like worship and practices, you know, mm-hmm. by, uh, by Jewish thinkers who were challenging that. And, and then so they would understand Passover in, the, in their context outside of you know, an exodus, a literal exodus, you know, from Egypt to, to the promised land. So you can see, you know, a bit of the connection there, uh, in some of this, you know, a gen- Genesis of how Christians talk about Passover out of sin, right? Well, what's the sin? The sin is all the bizarre, weird pagan garbage that you're involved in that you need to let go of and walk away from to walk in the ways of God and, uh, to honor this, you know, the God of Israel. So just an interesting, right. you know, the, 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 you know, getting back to that theme, you know, the secular world does not learn or, th- or really study idolatry. They don't understand what the concept is. Most people will tell you it's praying to a statue. But in the biblical sense, it was associated with all kinds of perverted sexual, social uh, taboos that we would find disgusting if we laid it out in detail today. And the details of that worship are actually known. They're actually recorded. We know what they were. And if we describe them here, if we describe them here, we'd have to probably, you know, filter our language an awful lot because you're dealing with a lot of disgusting uh, processes or activities, drug use, uh, you know, uh, alcohol use, debasing people's selves, cutting themselves, really, really strange behavior. Unspeakable, Alan. Yeah, that's a good good word. (laughs) Unspeakable. (laughs) Thank you for uh, helping me filter. So That's just the the pornographic world of today, Alan. That's all. Yeah, well, yeah, but it, it, I mean, the (laughs) idolatry was so extreme that it caught people's attention. It's not unlike what you see people being addicted to on the internet today. So, you can make, that's probably the closest analogy, but people don't go there and say, well, that's like idolatry because they don't know what idolatry is. Again, it's, well, it's a lack of, lack of fluency with the Bible and the concepts in the Bible. All right, Alan. Well, that's so a great what, segue to go what to room? number two, uh, breakout room number two. Um, we, it was, uh, I, I, I had the pleasure of being together with Dean and with uh, Moshe and um, I really hope that uh, Tiffany and Joe will also help mm-hmm. me out in my summary because they said some really beautiful things. And we also had Alisa, who also said some beautiful things, and Eva. And uh, I hope I didn't forget anybody. Anyway, what we talked about was um, how the laws pertaining to the pa- Passover uh, offering were fundamentally different because they wanted us to essentially bring the temple and its sanctity and its relationship with God into the home. The whole idea was not just to, the whole idea of the yeast, which I love that, that addition, um, this notion of uh, of of tearing us away, tearing away from the culture of the Egyptians by not allowing uh, anything, you know, yeasted, uh, leavened bread. Um, in the temple, you weren't allowed to have leavened bread. So therefore, in many ways, you were, you were transforming your home into a temple and you were bringing together the entire family. The Seder uh, it has children active, has elders active telling stories. It's multi-generational. It's, it's really making sure that the story is maintained day and night, as somebody mentioned, um, through, throughout, uh, from one generation to the next, but also to, to send a message that the, the, our relationship with God isn't something that is out there in the temple. It's something that we have to bring home, um, 
not just for our core family, but you typically to finish a lamb, you need more than one family. So it's bringing others who perhaps don't have families to bringing them into the home and making sure that everybody has an active part in, in, in re-experiencing the Exodus. Um, and, and with that, one might uh, say that we dealt also with the bonus questions um they're, they're jo Joe and Tiffany both the uh, expressed I think very beautifully this not this sense of 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 uh, the joining in with the Jewish people in the future uh, as as something that can be as described in the New Testament a, a grafting it's not a matter of replacing the Jewish Passover it's actually uh, drawing from the these kinds of roots into, into their own families, into their own society, um, and and uh, um, it, I, I would love actually for Joe and Tiffany perhaps to say what they said because uh, it was very touching. But I think that they the consensus definitely was with relating to the bonus questions that it's not a uh, a replacement of, and perhaps even Jesus in the last summer he was really having a seder that uh, trying to bring the story of Egypt and the ideas of freedom from and so, slavery and so forth, bringing them, uh, sharing them with, with the entire world. I will just um, say just what I said in the, the breakout is just how I felt like um, through divine orchestration, how in the last couple of years being brought more into observing the Jewish um, feast and in that encountering God in his heart and for his people and for the continuation of the story. And, and, and just saying, I don't see when reading um, in the New Testament, you know, where we get the communion, I don't see how that was meant to replace Passover. I don't, I don't see that. But just um, one thing I didn't say is um, I feel like in embracing the, the roots that we have through the Jewish feast, I feel like if more of us observed it, understood it, then it's impossible to be anti-Semitic. It's, it's impossible to do that if you embrace the whole entire storyline and see where your story came from and where it originated. And so just in that is something I want to bring more people into. And, and I had the pleasure of doing that and bring people into the different feasts who never celebrate or whatever, but just in that encountering um, God's heart and loving others better and, and, and well in that. And so I just appreciate that in that place of, of worship with family, that dynamic is something that we all can benefit from. And so I think it's just, it's just beautiful. So it makes me want to do it more. So I'm just grateful to be here to, you know, just grow that understanding and, and seeing the, the benefit, the beauty, the beauty of it. And almost in these days, how it's almost necessary because you can't, oppose something that that you learn that you're a part of Ooh, ooh, that was good tiffany mm -hmm. right. joe yeah yeah well and um i really appreciate our conversation and yeah i just see this as um from a christian perspective that um this jewish story should remain a jewish story and as Christians, I think we should assimilate into that story and find our place in there. Now, because the New Testament really um, teaches us that the identity of a Christian is really a Jewish identity, um, not maybe halakhically on the outside, but spiritually on the inside. Because, you know, Paul defines a Jew as one, a, a real Jew as one who is circumcised of the heart by the spirit. And that, um, and, and the New Testament goes on to tell us that we have been grafted into Israel, not re replacing Israel. And, uh, and so this, you know, the Torah can be interpreted, you know, at several levels. And if you just look at the story from a, a basic Peshat level, um, we may not see the connection, but because we're not in Egypt, but we need to remember this story because it parallels our spiritual journey out of idolatry, out of paganism, and into uh, a faith in the God of Israel. And, and, and you know, as, as Christians, we should embrace the Torah just as much as the Jewish people should. And, um, and I see that we are 
fellow citizens in this story. We are, um, you know, the New Testament teaches us that we are no longer foreigners as Gentiles who believe in a Jewish Messiah, that we are not long, no longer foreigners, but fellow citizens with God's holy people. And that, um, and, and that we are part of the Commonwealth of Israel. And so this story as Christians is now our story also. And so we should look for the, you know, the, the spiritual teaching that the Torah is trying to give us in this story so that we can continue our journey out of our Gentile roots, our, our idolatrous or pagan or whatever roots, into a true faith in the God of Israel. Because our New Testament finishes, well, this story finishes with Israel ending up in the promised land. Well, that's the way the New Testament finishes also. And, and if we embrace the New Testament, then this is our story also. Yeah. Terrific. Eve, did, Eve are, you adding, are you joining? You're also going to share something? Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't manage to, I didn't actually manage to say anything. But I, I really wanted to um, agree with them, the thinking and the sharing that uh, I, I noted from Alisa, Tiffany, and, um, and Joe Paul. And, and, and to say somebody commented that something about um, what made the, the Christians so uh, shocked. And I said one of the things that shocked the Christians was to realize that they weren't the new Israel that overthrows original Israel and 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 my understanding is that though it was so unfortunate but when that schism occurred um, around 100 AD or, 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 or 300 AD when um, the, the, the Gentiles were picking up um, this message uh, is that it allowed the Gentile nations um, unencumberedly to look at the Torah and the teaching that was coming from the Hebrew people and absorb it for themselves and, and, and imbibe it and, and make it part of their culture. But then came the time when they, the, the Gentiles had to realize that uh, uh, they're coming into this and pushing out Israel as it were wasn't so that, they, that Israel could be away forever. It was just to give them that opportunity um, to, to understand it for themselves and feel this is our message. But the time comes when the two have to come together and, um, and, and, and uh, the process of their come, in the process of their coming together, some of the wrong concepts that we had now picked up in the comfort of thinking we are the ones had have to be dropped. And I must say in my own experience, there was a time now as a Christian, I was wondering who exactly are the, the, are the Jewish people? And I remember having an experience in which um, I, I, it's as it were, that it, it, it as it were, uh, God was saying that uh, you need to know them because Ethnically, I am Jewish in presentation. So you need to know my people for that reason. If you are going to have a relationship with me, you need to know who would I have been if I walked the earth. And that was so subduing. And I began this walk. Actually, I sat at the feet of a rabbi who explained to me what the point of the Moadim was that they were reminders that as Alicia Tiffany said, is that um, there are rehearsals that begin to take you back to your history, to begin to know actually who you are. And the more I learned this, the more I began to understand that, ah, but my roots are not Rome and Christian. My roots are Hebrew and they, they my, the forefather isn't um, uh, St. Augustine. Or, and actually, the forefather is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so, and I've, our family has begun to practice some of these feasts 
And now we are beginning to understand all the whole points of the Passover is a, a, we stop call, I, I don't call it Easter or Easter. I now tell people that it's Pisa, uh, Pisa Passover, or in the vernacular, they translated it as uh, Pascha. And, um, and now, so, so as um, someone else said, I'm beginning to see that not just sections of the Torah are so relevant to us. The, there is just so much wealth in it that can govern how even I can walk and live as the Christian or the Gentile that has come into this commonwealth. And there is no more pride in it. There is no more feeling that um, we are a superior people. We just have the senses, we understand it better and we are grateful and we are sorry that it costs Israel to have to be pushed out for a bit for us to get an into this. But now it is our responsibility to ensure that we come together with Israel and help them to understand that we are not coming in to displace anything. We are coming in as a brother, a younger brother with an older brother uh, to walk with and, and to show us even new things that we lost um, when we were just doing and walking it alone. Thank you. Thank you. Eve. All right. We are well over time. So I apologize if any of you are, are dragging on, not uh, being too polite to sign off, just so you know. But we have room number one, I think, because that was room two. Can we just yeah. very quickly get a feedback? And I'm from going to piggyback off of what Eve just said. And you guys can all chime in. It was Alan and Mary and Christiane. And we had uh, Ruth and Rick and Yonatan and Miriam. And we actually connected the Pesach uh, event with the Akita or the Akita. And because the lamb was the center of the Akita, Yitzchak says to his father, "Where I here's the wood, <laughs> but where is the lamb? And Avraham says to Yitzchak, Hashem will provide the lamb. So we talked about the fact that the, the lamb is center stage in the Abrahamic covenant and the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. And now it is coming back as the point of redemption for Israel to come out of Egypt. But again, it's about the firstborn. Yitzchak was the firstborn. And here we are dealing with the lamb and the blood uh, because at midnight, Hashem is going, the angel is going to come and he will show mercy on the firstborn and on the house of Israel and judgment on the firstborn uh, of, of uh, Mitzrayim, of, of Egypt. So, and then we talked about the lamb, this, for this Parsha, the lamb being the sin offering. And the connection with the lamb, you would have to take the matzah, the unleavened bread. And it actually says in this Torah portion that you need to take the broken pieces of the meal offering, which was the unleavened bread. And we talked about the connection between the lamb, the, the life which is in the blood, and the healing of the, uh, of the nation coming out of Mitzrayim. So these were some of the things that we touched on, which again is very interesting that it takes us back to the Abrahamic covenants as we are also coming out of uh, and that's a, what what happens after after the Akedah. What you see is Hashem reaffirms reaffirms with uh, Abraham that he's going to be the father of many nations. This is then a, you know we have all of the covenants moving in force. That so that's one thing. And Alan and and uh, anyone else would like to add something else? That's uh,
we'll just chime in real briefly. I had an additional note. <clears throat> Dean had brought up in his presentation two of the Egyptian gods, Amon and Kun. Oh, yeah. So those are kind of uh, oblique references. They, they seem strange and out of place, but Kun was the deity in charge of the Nile, just to let anybody know. And Am Amun is an alternate name of Amon. <clears throat> he was the chief um, uh, Egyptian deity that was worshipped as a local god in the Egyptian city of No, which is known as Thebes in Greek, um, was subsequently became the capital of Egypt. Jeremiah foretold the conquest of Egypt and is a reference. Jeremiah 46.25 to this deity. Rashi, uh, a 12th century rabbi, explains that Amun is the name of the Egyptian's heavenly minister, meaning um, like an angel, I guess. Similarly, Rabbi Abraham Saba writes that Amun of No was the demonic minister in charge of the powers of Egyptian witchcraft. Just thought that would be an interesting thing. There are other sources that relate him as Satan's assistant. So, again, getting into this notion of understanding ancient idolatry, there, there are roots, there are theologies around this that most modern people are just not aware of. So I just thought I'd throw in uh, some of those reflections. Mm. Thank you, Alan. We also talked about fear, Gabriel, but from a, a, an emotional aspect. So often, you know, we look at the slavery mindset, but fear is not just a mindset. Fear is something that happens to the nephesh. It can happen to the spirit. And it can, there can be such a breach when you've had a trauma, such a breach to the spirit that it's, it's irrational, the kind of fear you experience until you're made whole and healed from that fear. So... Oh, that's, that's, uh, well, I think we talked about fear as well. And I, I think the, the, the part, the positive part that we ended on with it was this question of what is it you're trusting in? Who is it you're trusting in? And in this experience with Israel coming out of Egypt, if their trust was placed in the God of their fathers, then that was the right place. And that then they'd be able to recover from the fear and also live through the future experiences that weren't necessarily going to be easy, you know, that would require you to be able to walk in a stability uh, in, in, in order to pursue the things that God wanted for them. So, yeah, well, thank you, everybody. I think uh, we've gone a little bit late, but I hope you all feel that it was worth it. And uh, thank you for sharing and pouring out all these beautiful ideas. I hope we all get to chew on them and get uh, more out of it. Well, I did understand in the first sentence written there, uh, yeah, yeah, we were talking about the pink elephant, number two. And I asked, I, I said that I, it was uh, long and complex and I asked Dean to explain. So I'll tell you what I understood and then- oh, oh, But hang on, hang on, now that I know your ears in the room, Okay, that we don't just have an elephant, but we also have the ear. Uh, I'm hoping that he will record this session. I just did. That's my brother. Okay, okay. fine. So, so what I was beginning to say was that the first sentence uh, was clear because we were talking about that a lot, of the sense of continuation, not replacement which brings to a joining of the two uh, uh, branches uh, and not one replacing the other. That's, that's fine. But this, the second question, when you're talking about validating the Jewish representation of Israel's history and the Jewish understanding in relationship with God, you mean by the Christians, yes? Yes. Okay, and pursuing the universal application. So you guys already do that fine enough. <laughs> and you mean not the specific Christian application, but a universal, which is a continuation of the Jewish. Mm -hmm. Do I understand you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we are we, we're in the midst of an evolving story. Yes, but, but the, 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 if we're talking about elephants today, the, the point is, as I see it, that you are... Uh, 
disconnecting from the Last Supper with its uh, ideas or symbols and just saying it was a Passover, it was a Jewish Passover, it was a Pesach, and let's do Pesach together. You know, I, I, I'm not saying that. Um, because well, there are all, all kinds of, uh, of uh, guys uh, in that picture. <laughs> no, but, but I'm, not, I'm not imposing you to come into that picture. That, oh. That's really important. Okay. But I'm not going to give up what that picture has done for me. You know, I'm not talking about Leonardo da Vinci's picture. Uh, but until I connected that picture to your picture, wow, all of a sudden I'm going, well, this isn't just something historic. This is, there's a part in this movie that really began with you folk and covenants made with people before you. And you've done a really good job of keeping that script going. In fact, if you hadn't, we might not even have an Israel today. Uh, if, if you assimilated 2,000 years ago, uh, thank God you did it, okay? Uh, thank God you resisted, okay? Cost you. Uh, but the reality is, is it's given us time to begin to mature, and hopefully we'll come to greater fullness. We're not there yet, please. Uh, but when we do, I think there's something that's bigger than both of us. Uh, and, and I, and I, and if I could say this much, I think it's related to Jeremiah 16, 14, uh, uh, 16, where there'll come a day where the Israelites will no longer say that their God is the God of exactly. the land of Egypt, but they will say he's the God of the, of the four corners of the earth. And, and, and somehow that's, we're in the midst of that part of the story. And in the midst of that story, we're coming out of anti-Semitism in the church. We got to do it in that. We got to be judged in the church first before we can see it uh, coming out of the world. And and I'm not suggesting that there's not going to be a lot more judgment, uh, maybe even worse than you guys saw uh, back in in Egypt. That's that's not going to help bring that about. And and I don't think the judgments are just going to happen in one nation. If I understand Jeremiah properly, the nations, they call it Jacob's trouble. You guys get delivered. But I'll tell you, if it doesn't shift the, the rest of ones in the nations, it, 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 it's not it's not an IC. But it's necessary for redemption. I'd, I'd like... You know, Dean, what? You know, the, you know Dean, uh, when you were talking, I thought and uh, mentioning the... You took my word of a picture of the Last Supper or the picture of the of the Seder night uh, came to my mind. I don't remember specifically a picture, but in the, in the Haggadah, in the Seder uh, Order. night uh, text, uh, there's a, a piece talking about a meeting. I suppose it was a supper. Uh, it took all night with a set of rabbis, which the the largest, uh, the, the most known was Rabbi Akiva. And this thing happened uh, only a few dozen years after the Last Supper. And the common thing between the leader of the Last Supper and Rabbi Akiva, they were both killed by the Romans. That's interesting. Mm. Okay? Which means that uh, we share something that uh, the Romans uh, were not uh, God believers. They were uh, they were pagans. Uh, pagans. They were, pa they were pagans. Yes. So uh, coming together uh, to a uh, a get together uh, Pesach Passover. Uh, of the two branches, as I call them, may come to say that uh, a one God versus uh, paganism is uh, something that we share together, right? Amen. In, in fact, 
when I do the uh, Passover, when I do a Passover Seder, I'm going to do one a little bit earlier. I focus on the table that we use, which was under Roman occupation. It was called the triclinium. It's U-shaped. And I, I, I try to bring forth the message that I believe Jesus tried to bring at, at a Passover meal under Roman occupation uh, in line of who reclined where. And ultimately, through the process, you find out that not only he honored his most beloved disciple, he also honored the one to whom would be his enemy on the right and left side. When I ask Christians, they all think it was two of his most loved ones. And ultimately, the, the person who's sitting in the servant spot doesn't perform his servant spot, but he knows he needs, because he's first in the room, to take the least seat, okay, which was a parable. Was thought, and what ultimately comes through, at least is is what I'm looking to achieve, is the success that in the power of love, that ultimately come to the fullness of redemption, that uh, that which once was enemies are going to be uh, our neighbors, and, uh, and 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 so I, I can't say enough. I really believe this. This feast, which has in fact been the crucible to anti-Semitism, okay, uh, is all, I believe God in his redemptive ways will ultimately use it. Do I know how? Uh, no, no. Do I have some speculations? Very little. But I really believe it's going to be used to bring the world together uh, as one. Uh, with him. And so uh, that's why I feel the conversation needs to be started. And Enome has already kickstarted that uh, a few years back. I found a very interesting uh, uh, text from a rabbi from Australia, retired already, Rabbi Raymond Apple is his name. And uh, he writes about freedom, feardom, fear, and feardom, the concepts of Passover. And he's talking about, and this connects us again, because even though the Romans were talking about democracy, there, there was a lot of fear, and, and it was not a fear way of living. They had slaves. It, it wasn't uh, very different from Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, Christianity through the years and the centuries uh, and uh, through the Western civilization uh, took the uh, Hebrew idea of, of freedom and developed it. And democracy or liberal democracy, as it should be called, is a very basic uh, faith now. It isn't just a system. It's a, people believe in it. And in Israel now we are we have a fight about it. So uh, on the understanding of the uh, freedom and uh, of the citizenship and liberalism. So uh, taking uh, the mission of bringing uh, freedom and abolishing freedom and maintaining freedom together with a, a mutual Passover, that can be a very interesting mission. I want to share that uh must have been about 12 years ago, um, we decided as a family, that is my siblings and my parents, all together to have a Seder. Uh, and we did so, we found a place where we, which had enough room for all of us. And we went to the synagogue, of course, which was my, my father's synagogue. And a whole group, a very large group, there must have been at least five or six um, students of uh, 
um, students to become pastors came by the synagogue and asked if they could join us for the Seder. Um, and my father was a bit, uh, um, it, it, it wasn't so much reluctant. He saw an inherent conflict here because we know that when it comes to uh, eating from the Passover um, sacrifice, um, those who are not circumcised um, are, are, are not allowed to eat from it. That's, that's written in our Parsha, right? So um, one can, of course, wonder what kind of circumcision would be expected in the future. Uh, whether it's a circumcision of, uh, of, of, the, of the flesh or a circumcision of the heart, or these are all questions that we don't have answers for. But one thing we know for sure is that uh, there are many places in, in, in the prophets which talk about, I would even just mention Zechariah too, where he talks about how uh, many nations will join in the process of collecting the Jews from all of from all corners of the world and they will also join as the people of, of Israel. In other words, there is definitely a, a notion of on one hand there is the people that God has created through the histor you know the history that, that we've been through, but there is also this notion of, of perhaps a greater Israel which will include all, all those who will join the Jewish people in the temple um, in, 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 a, in a variety of ways that's actually described in Isaiah 56. So I think we can already see in the beginning, in, in, in the prophets, the beginnings of what you're describing, Dean, of uh, ultimately um, coming together uh, it's very interesting even that the Parsha, at the end of the Parsha, emphasizes that the laws pertaining to the Passover shall apply not just to um, to the uh, civilians, to the Jews, but also to the Gerim, uh, to, which can be a question. What exactly, what kind of Gerim are they or strangers? Uh, do they convert? Do they not convert? These are all discussions that I'm sure will, will will ultimately take place. But we can definitely see that there is that um, the, the the desire for this covenant between God and Israel being extended to anyone who wants to join. The facts are that when Israel left Egypt, they did not leave alone. We know that there were a lot of Egyptians that joined them as well and that's 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 clearly written the the fact is that the plagues were designed to open up the eyes of the egyptians to the god of israel and wanted god would have preferred that they would have listened then and and perhaps joined in going to uh, to to, ce to celebrate with god uh, you know out in the desert um but they chose not to so clearly the, god wants what you're saying to ultimately happen i, I completely I, I feel very very strongly that you're right that ultimately this is what happened but exactly how it will happen i think we'll need some guidance maybe the one described in the haftarah elijah coming and uh, helping reconcile between fathers and sons might shed some light on how that will happen because my father like i said he was conflicted he said well but wait a minute these guys i don't know if you know they if, if they can eat the passover lamb together with us now of course we didn't have a passover lamb because we don't have the temple yet but uh i, I would like to but 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 the idea of you know the family getting together with the passover lamb this is clearly a very very important um uh, like you said, it, it's like an experience that happens every year and helps us identify who we are and help the children understand their history. And it's like, you know, such an important holiday in terms of perpetuating the Jewish identity. So my father invited them. They came for the first part of the Seder. And then when we got to the Magid, the part where we actually 
start talking about the discussion where we wanted the kids to feel comfortable and to be able to participate with that. So um, we, we, we had them for the beginning of the Seder. And I think that maybe in the future they'll be able to stay to the end, but we still have to figure out how to do that. But I would love to go to your first three questions because I thought they were so good. Good, good, good. Thank you for sharing that. By the way, our rabbi gave an entire lesson on your first question. Really? Yep. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Because you know what? I don't think I've ever had that question before, but I think this question is the key, is one of the keys with Malachi, okay, to be getting to that place because, uh, you know, we're led to believe that they got to take this three-day journey, and it's done in the midst, you know, and if it wasn't done in the midst of them, the fear of God may not have been able to go into the nations because, you know, Israel is playing this key part to help us in the nations uh, come to know the God of Israel. And, well, uh, well, let's put it this way, Dean. If, if, if Pharaoh would have relented, he would have conceded uh, and allowed us to go out to the journey. I mean, if you recall, his initial proposals were they, was that they do it there. Uh, but Moshe says, well, the people will uh, stone us if we do that. I mean, this is something that, you know, we, we don't want to be an affront to the Egyptian culture. We want to go out to the desert so we won't be stepping on anybody's toes, right? But when 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 Pharaoh goes down to the wire, refuses to let us go out, so it's almost like this is what our rabbi said. He said, it's like, he said, well, if you're not willing to accept the God of Israel, then we're going to do it here in front of you, and you'll see you won't be able to do anything about it. And it was kind of a response to Pharaoh's rejection of uh, of the God of Israel. So it... it, and, it I, and another point I thought of, you wanted to say something, yeah? No, no, no. Another point was that... You know, there's a saying that you can't jump over a, uh, a creek or an uh, abyss or with two steps, yeah? You have to do it with one big jump, right? Right. And sometimes you call it a leap of faith, right? Right. And that's exactly <laughs> what they had to do. They had to take themselves, catch themselves from the hair I don't have, and pick themselves up and jump. That was the test. That was the. That was another the, thing that was very much discussed in that uh, session that we had with the rabbi was the the need for Israel. It's like you know, think about their slaves. They they they're really afraid of doing anything you know that would upset an Egyptian because uh, um, in the past it was uh, it, it was yeah. probably not a good outcome. So um, here. It was necessary for them. It, it was. It, they just had to do this in order to to show that they are ready to go. That they really are ready to, for not just to go, but they are ready to go ahead and serve the God of Israel. It really takes the guts, like you described it so beautifully in your questions. I mean, look, look, what kind of? It took an awful lot of guts to tie that goat out you know for a couple of days all the egyptians you know see this and and you who knows what would normally have happened and uh to go ahead and to slaughter it and to put the blood on the on the it, it's i think it's more for you to say this is the how a house where we serve god and not a house where we serve the pharaoh, the, the pharaoh. and this is like it's it's even because the rabbi asked, "What do you mean? God didn't know which homes were homes of the Israelites? I mean, there were several plagues where the distinction was made between homes of the Israelites and and the rest. But uh, the point it was that we needed to do this. It was important for us to say we are serving God, the God of Israel, and not the God of the Egyptians." And there are even uh, commentaries that say only a fifth of the Jewish people really survived 
uh, that that 80% of the Israelites didn't have the guts to do this or didn't want to leave or whatever it was. And only 20% actually did what they had to do. And that's why it is it is a sense of Passover because God only passed over them, didn't pass over those who didn't have the guts to do it. Another thought that came to my mind was that telling them to tie the lamb to their bed for three days, four days, uh, was uh, similar to telling them to cut their ties. Their, it's like a Gordian knot that you have to disconnect from your own ties to the old faith, from the fear from the Egyptians, mm -hmm. from the from uh, being a slave and, and becoming free. So uh, you tie the lamb and you untie yourself. Ah, nice. <clears throat> Good, well said. How about anybody else up there? Anybody else want to make some comments? Is please weigh yeah, in. I, yeah, I wouldn't mind um, contributing a little bit there. Um, I really appreciated your, your story about um, inviting those uh, Christians to the, your Passover Seder. Um, yeah, I think that um, you know. I may not see things exactly the way, you know, the mainstream Christian world would see things as far as our identity as Christians and how we relate to this story. Um, I see it as a continuation of the Jewish story. I see in the New Testament tells me that um, a Christian is basically, you know, um, anybody who follows, you know, a Jewish Messiah. Right, it's, you know, it's the, an anointed one, and um, and the New Testament tells us that you know a Gentile who believes in a Jewish Messiah actually becomes Jewish, not halakhically, physically on the outside, but spiritually on the inside. You know, Romans talks about you know a true Jew is one who is circumcised of the heart by the Spirit. Um, you know, in Phili uh, Philippians, or uh, it talks about. Uh, Paul telling Gentiles, you also are the circumcision, not of the flesh, but of the heart. And um, I think this is, um, you know, what was promised, you know, not only in the Torah, but to the prophet Jeremiah, that a new covenant would be established one day, and that it would involve not an outward change, but an inward change. And, um, but the Torah... And the Jewish story would continue from that. And I think Yair mentioned, you know, that there were a mixed multitude that left Egypt. And this became part of their story also. And um, from my studies, I think it was Rob Cook who actually said that Moses invited them to join the people of Israel. And they were absorbed into the people of Israel rather than you know being on the outside and so this also became their story and that's how i see it as a christian also is that not only is this a jewish story but i am joining the jewish people in their story which has now become my story also and it's the same kind of spirit i think that when ruth uh, converted uh, she said that you know to naomi that your god will be my god and your people will be my people. Where you go, I will go. You know, where you die, I will die. And that's kind of the way I approach my faith and this Passover Seder, that I'm coming alongside my Jewish brethren. And this is now also my story. I throw my lot of my life in with their lot and their destiny, and I'm joining them on that journey. So that's kind of the way I see, see it from a Christian perspective. Beautiful. Kind of grafting, huh? Yes, absolutely. Grafting, <laughs> not a replacement. I don't believe in replacement theology, but I do believe in, you know, whether you want to call it Rob Cook's absorption theology <laughs> or um, or the, you know, grafting in theology. That's that's what I think the New Testament presents, and that in some in some respect, you know, we are, you know, Christians who really are Jewish, you know, in the heart, maybe not halakhically on the outside. And it's really interesting because there's a think tank in Jerusalem that's raising these questions. I think it's Rabbi Cardoso, 
is raising these questions of who exactly is a Jew, and this discussion is happening within Judaism, and he's talking about this concept that there may be Gentiles out there who have Jewish souls, but they're in Gentile bodies. And where do these people fit into this? And and I think your story here, it, you know, it kind of touches on this idea of, you know, wrestling with this, you know, where do we fit into this? And that's, so that's where right now I, I feel I fit in is I, you know, it says in the New Testament that, you know, that Christians, we're no longer foreigners, but fellow citizens with God's holy people and that we are part of the Commonwealth of Israel. And so the Israel theme is very strong in the New Testament. And it goes right to the end of the story where Israel comes out on top and we are part of that story. So, and the whole New Testament is really based on the final redemption is going to be like the first redemption and it's and the New Testament um, unfolds in that way. So, so in that respect, it's my story also as a Christian. Love it. Well stated, Joe. Alyssa, <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany, Eve, get in this discussion a little bit. No, just looking at the um, third question, is there a message for the worship of God first in your homes as priestly families? Do we see any relationship between priestly duties, sacrifice, and worship in this week's Leviticus Torah portion and Passover? And just, um, you know, just like he said, I agree. Like, just, just one looking at the Passover and where communion came from, and when I read and I look at it, I don't see where it was ever meant to replace um Passover. So I don't make that connection. But what I'm grateful for is in the last few years, just feeling like, um, I guess you say just by, you know, divine orchestration, just been brought into wanting to observe the different Jewish feasts um, and bringing other people into it. And what I found in those moments is just such a holiness and connecting with the story of the storyline, because in it, you can't disconnect from um, how the Lord instituted it and why he instituted it. And it is all to me about remembrance. You have to go back to what that story is. So you're rehearsing it. You know, every time you engage, you know, um, in the Passover and other feasts, you're rehearsing the storyline. And the way I see it is how God has um, um, connected to my own story is that he's, he's a provider. You know, he's a, 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 a perfect leader and he's a protector. And you see that in Israel's story, you know, in coming out of Egypt into the wilderness and how he's, you know, supplied for them, provided for them, protected them, um, and how he led them with a, a cloud by day and a fire by night. And so saying all that to say, I feel like there is a message um, for all people when we engage in this and with the, with the true narrative and storyline that it connects us to God and his heart. Um First for for Jewish people and for Israel, but then for and then for the nation. So just something beautiful about that. So I just think it's really cool how he just brought me into that, and I want to bring other people into that. That it's around the table, it's in the place of of, of a home, it's in the place of of worship with one another. That we remember these things. That is just it's just so holy for me. So that's just what I would say about that. Mm. Thank you. That was so beautiful. Yeah. Anybody else want to wade into these waters? Uh, I would like to just point out, and I re really hope that Eve and Alyssa would also join, uh, but I really want to point out that uh, you mentioned earlier, Dean, how there is a there are a few fundamental differences between this offering and all the other offerings that we're familiar with. And um, one of them being, of course, that... Uh, you kind of get a sense that everybody's got to take the offering home and to make the home a place that is a temple. Uh, even the whole thing about cleaning away, making sure that there is no uh, leavened bread and all that, but because in the temple, you weren't allowed to have leavened bread. It's like really coming in and saying the home must become your temple. You have to, you, you have to sanctify the home and you have to make sure that all of the the entire family and just like if and if you don't have enough people to finish this uh this lamb then 
then expand your family, which I think is also a very essential point here that God, you know, by having requiring that you finish it all in one night and you don't break any bones and all that, it kind of creates a situation where you have to extend your family, which is also, I think, such a, an important principle that we don't think of ourselves, don't think just of our family, our core family needs, but we're always looking beyond that. Um, I, I think that by looking into the details of this offering, we can also gain a much deeper understanding regarding what God wants us to do, not just on Passover, but perhaps all year round, to really make sure that church or shul or the synagogue is, is someplace out there. In the home, it's one thing, and when you go out, it's another thing. It has to all be um the same relationships the same sanctity the same way we treat others has to be the same whether it's in the temple or at home mm -hmm. and, and i think that there's such a lesson in what you're sharing because uh i think especially uh as parents if we can connect with this truth and begin with making our home uh, the family altar, begin with making our home uh, uh, critical uh, to uh, serving God from, uh, it helps us beyond the home in other things that we're doing. And uh, we have some New Testament scriptures that talk about that uh, uh, for one to be a, 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 uh, a qualified bishop, he must manage his family well. And so I would have to believe that that management of that family well uh, would include uh, ensuring that his home is, is a temple. How, how can I do any good in the Lord's house if, in fact, I haven't begun in my own home? Uh, so so anyways, good, good point. And it, I, it's also multi-generational, by the way. The whole idea, I mean, I don't know what a degree everybody here is familiar with how the Seder is actually constructed to make sure that the children really get involved. And it's amazing to see how the children lasting through the Seder typically till after midnight, even the, even the very young ones, because you know, we're really having, getting everybody together, you're getting the grandparents and the parents and the children and the babies. And it's like making, by creating it a multi-generational experience, you're also guaranteeing the continuation. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Anybody else? Okay, I can share a little bit. Um, I think from the also question number three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the tour portion. So, um, what I've been learning as I studied this Torah portion was like the sacrifices. This was a kind of new concept for me, but the sacrifices not being necessarily a payment for sin. Some of them, most of them, but mostly the purpose, the heart behind the sacrifices to draw closer to God. That was the main part of what I've been learning. Yes. And so I thought, okay, so of course, um, Pesach, Passover, um, Definitely, definitely, always a time to, to grow closer <laughs> to to the Lord, to God. And um, also, um, what was I going to say? Sorry. Passover. Um, it'll come to me in a minute. <laughs> Sorry. Take your time. Um, yes, there was something I was going to say. Oh, the beautiful thing of not only on Passover, but it, if I understand correctly, in Jewish, Jewish tradition, it's every day you are to remember as if you came out of Egypt, correct? So, um, day and yeah, night being like this. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> anyways, really good for us to take hold of that basically. <laughs> yeah. Alyssa, thank you very much. Getting into the Passover, I guess, uh, what is it? it's the does it start tomorrow? Is it no the Wednesday fifth? night? Wednesday. Okay. So that's the fifth, right? Where you are the yeah. second, third, fourth, fifth. Okay. Wednesday night. Good stuff. I did, 
Hi, Paul. What does it start on on Wednesday night? Passover. Oh. So the Seder yeah. the Seder is on Wednesday night, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't eat any bread from Wednesday morning, um, but the Seder itself is Wednesday night. And then you do you not have bread for a while? Like it's yeah, for the whole week. For the whole week, right? So it's matzah week. Hi, Dina. Yeah. I mean, listen, the truth is you don't actually have to eat matzah. You, don't you just to. can't eat bread. <laughs> <laughs> what about cakes? Do you have crackers? Rice crackers, maybe? <laughs> you can make all kind of stuff with matzah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You but anything that involves, you know, wheat and Hi, yeast Dina. and uh, those kind of things. No yeast. Is a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do did you, and all those did you follow the ritual that they did years ago, thousand years ago, hundred years ago, where they would clean the whole house? Yeah, it's been going on for the past two weeks. Okay. Yeah. Oh, they, you started early. Yeah. Okay. Well, awesome. I have three boys. You know, I'm I'm keep cleaning, and they are keep uh, they keep eating. So it's uh, <laughs> it's a <stuck. laughs> Yeah, they hide food where you don't want them to hide them. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's part of... <laughs> Done that, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, Dina had seven sons and, and one daughter. So, I mean, that's like another level of... Wow. Uh, yes, yes, that was always fun. You know, you'd be cleaning and then some kid, some little toddler would be spreading cookies all over the place yeah, after yeah, you've yeah. already cleaned everything. Mommy, come say hello. I'm here with my mom. Oh, nice. um, mommy, just say hello. Yeah, You're saying hello to Gabriel Hi. and to Jocelyn hello. and Jonathan. You have just move over so they can see you. Say hello. Hi. The other way, the other Good. way. Jacqueline and Good. Jonathan. Yes. Yeah. We're on email. Good morning from Canada. Okay. Thank nice. you. Nice to see you all. Yeah, nice to see you. Nice you. meeting you. Nice, nice so meeting nice. you. Jocelyn. Glad you could join us. Yes. Nice, yes. Jonathan. And Paul, we're from all over the world, Mommy, and we're studying Parashat Shavua, the portion of the week, and talking about the Pesach, mm -hmm. talking about the Korban Pesach. Okay. Oh. Okay. Thank you. So feel, feel, feel at home. My mom's just going to eat here on the side and, and listen in. Wonderful. Oh, awesome. I will. Awesome. Yeah, that she can join us. Welcome, welcome. Um, Gabe, do you see my, the questions? Yeah, we do. I'm just looking at the, I'm looking over them. Yeah. Did anybody... Um, Anybody have any curiosity? I mean, just anything pop into your head while Dean was sharing? Anything that just kind of stood out to you or before we just pick a question? I was wondering about um, in the elephant's questions, he said, um, where is that? Uh, number three, there's a number three missing, no? Just two questions? Yeah, what is that? Something here. There's kind of like two prefaces, and then there's the two questions he put there. Right. Anyway, he said something about, um, you know, Exodus being the first Exodus. What does that mean? Is that like a Christian uh, phrase? Oh, um, I think. Did he say that? I, yeah, I, I think he was probably in Dean's context. Usually, he's the second Exodus is the return to the land now. That basically oh. that we're witnessing the second exodus even now. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if that's something Christian that I'm like missing. <laughs> yeah, no, there's there's no. Uh, I don't. We don't usually use that language uh, to refer to anything about Passover. Um, I I mean, maybe no. someone could say a spiritual exodus, maybe, but uh, that not mm -hmm. usually a second exodus. Not usually. It's become though. It's become sort of common practice in many seders and in modern times in Israel, but not only in Israel, that people will tell the story of their Aliyah. That's nice. Or the story of their of their leaving, like my mother leaving Germany, leaving Berlin um, in 1940. Wow. And and their feeling of, of, you know, leaving a place of where they were enslaved or oppressed and, and making Aliyah. And I think many people now, that's how they see it. They tell their stories to their children and grandchildren. That's beautiful to really see the opportunity to, to return to, you know, 
the homeland right. of the Jewish people really is an opportunity. As, say, as we say on Seder night, that each person uh, should see themselves as if they left Egypt. Uh, you can put the questions back up, Jonathan. Uh, I'm sorry. I think it's uh, stopped. Definitely helpful to stir up more thoughts. Yeah, let's start with these here, and then um, what message can be interpreted? What messages can be interpreted in the Passover lamb offering, which was an abomination to Egypt, taking place in Egypt, and not a three days journey, as requested? You know, sometimes maybe just a, a thought that I have, sometimes I really wish I could understand better the context in which, you know, these events occurred because without understanding the context of Egyptian culture, understanding the context of like, what was it like to do the Passover uh, offering in Egypt? Like, you know, understanding the confrontation, maybe the cultural confrontation that Dean was alluding to. Uh, it's it's kind of hard as a modern person to to try to understand this like in its right context, you know. So that's why I always appreciate teachers or people who are very educated and understand better, and that they can explain a little bit of the cultural context. I always enjoy hearing that uh, about these ancient cultures like Egypt, you know, to just have a at least some kind of an idea, you know. <laughs> Jocelyn, you can you don't have to raise your hand. You can just share. Yeah. Um... Well, when Moses, can you go up, up to where Moses is saying about uh, we cannot do the uh, the sacrifice? How does he how does he say it there? Uh, the sacrifice that we offer to the Lord are an abomination to it. It doesn't say exactly what you're saying, then uh, Gabriel. You know, the what were the gods of Egyptians then? What were they? Were they, you know, um, bowing to different animals? What, like, what were they worshiping? If they were worshiping, just the their king, their the pharaoh. Was it pharaoh? No, that was Exodus. Who was the who was the the king then of the Egyptians? What I can say is uh, the Egyptians, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, you can hear yes. me. Great. Yeah, generally, the African culture is a culture that comes with a lot of gods. We worshipped animals, we worshipped trees, we worshipped uh, water bodies. So the gods are just numerous in different numbers. So now, according to Dean's presentation, the, the, the sheep was a deity in Egypt. And if you realize that actually the nine plagues are all linked to the nine gods in Egypt, uh, as God was dethroning them through the nine plagues that were happening. So Egyptians had many gods, but at least the prominent ones that were in existence by that time were the nine gods. And uh, amazingly, the perspective that uh, Dean has brought today is, for example, like the perspective that led to the formation of the nation of Pakistan, because Pakistan and India were one nation. But the, the, the issue was most Indians were practicing, practicing Buddhism, uh, which was right from their father, Mahatma Gandhi, who was a prominent person that they reverenced in their country. But then there were Indian Muslims in the country. And with Indians, they had several gods, Others worship the cow, and others worship maybe a goat, you know, and and yet to the Muslims, these were animals that they would slaughter to do their celebrations. And so here will come uh, a Buddhist walking by only to see a Muslim uh -huh. slaughtering his god. So that brought a lot of chaos and fights until now all the Muslim Indians had to go and form a new nation, which is Pakistan. So I think if, if we look at the scenario right now uh, in this, it's like the scenario that was in Egypt then. But what I'm thinking is that uh, by the time Passover happened, uh, God had already proven himself strong 
uh, and Pharaoh had already got into the breaking point. And if I could say, if there were going to be riots over murdering one of their deities, I think by this time they were humbled by the circumstances that were prevailing that they could no longer raise a finger to protest against the mother of their God. I think it's... Mm -hmm. um, what was the question again? Uh, I, it was more like I had just raised this question of, uh, you know, understanding this in the context of the culture, you know, it's very helpful to understand, you know, kind of a little bit better about what was going on in Egypt and what the culture was to understand, like, when you talk about this subgroup of people that were basically slaves um, to Pharaoh's kingdom, you know, then obeying, you know, and, and transitioning to do, to actually following the observance of a Passover as like kind of the initiation of the exit. Uh, it's, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's helpful to understand the context because then you know that it was actually a confrontational, um, cultural event in a way, if I can say it that way. Yes. And, and also there were two actions that the Israelites were asked to do, which involved a great courage, um, and sacrifice. One was really slaughtering this God of, of Egypt, the Paschal lamb. Um, and, and, and putting the blood on the doorposts, right? Uh, and the other was the circumcision, the Brit Mila, which also involved blood and difficulty and sacrifice. It's sort of the people had to show they were dedicated and willing to sacrifice. Um, and that made them worthy of redemption. They had to do something for their own redemption. Mm -hmm. You know, another thing, Dina, uh, I thought you were going to mention that it took courage also to put blood on the doorposts because you're identifying your house visually from the outside as being part of something, right? A, 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 yes. A, a confrontational, a cultural, a culture war, maybe you could say it that way, mm -hmm. um, that was occurring. That's true. And there's also the two, the two things that we still do, which bring in Elijah and Liao Hanavi uh, to even today. Uh, in circumcisions, there's a special chair of Elijah, where the person holds the baby, kind of the 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 Godfather kind of yeah. holds the baby, and the circumcision is done on that chair. And we say, "Look, Elijah, we're still keeping the covenant, unlike what you what you accused us of." And also, we have a special place and a special cup for Elijah for Eliyahu uh, at the seder. So these are two things that are also connected with Elijah. We also said is Haftorah, where we say that Eliyahu, Elijah, will come before the great and awesome day. So if he's definitely part of this whole uh, Passover um, ceremony. And uh, I really also think that um, the... Let me just use the same word slaughtering. I think the slaughtering of the gods of Egypt or just dethroning them began all the way through the plagues because if you look at the god of the Nile which is the dragon that the Egyptians worshipped and the Nile turned into blood you know that he was already dethroned except that for the sheep uh, here it is a different flavor that he this god was not just dethroned but this was now used as a sacrifice uh, for, for, for the Jewish people. So it's just like almost the same thing that has been happening all along, but now it is in a different flavor. And, and Gabriel, as you're talking about the culture, definitely it was very offensive to the culture. But I think by this time, the Egyptians really were like, these people just must go. <laughs> we are not going to care about what they're doing or what they have done against their God. All we know is they need to leave the land. So. I just feel at this point, whatever happens to the culture or to the traditions that were available uh, was no longer, an, as much as it was an offense, it was something they couldn't, they didn't have the power to respond to. Mm -hmm. so, uh, that's good. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, forgive me. Um, my brain is not working so good this morning. Okay. Um, 
at this point in Leviticus, are they not in, in, in uh, away from Egypt? Are they not out of Egypt? It's, it's not. And, uh, no, they're still. Are they still no, in with Exodus. the Egyptians? Or is it that when they left we're, we're, the, the Egypt, they brought some Egyptian with them and they don't want to offend them? No, but we're reading from like Exodus confused. today. We're not reading from Leviticus today. Oh. But, yeah, Passover has not yet happened. That means they have not yet left it's Egypt. In, it's and Exodus. Well, yeah. Yeah, we're reading well, for Exodus because of Passover coming up. Yeah. Oh, because here the parsha, the Torah is Leviticus 6, 1. Right. Okay, so now that's why I'm confused. Okay. Yes, <laughs> Justin, so we're really dealing with, with, with Exodus because of the Passover coming up Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. Ah. I'm sorry. That it was, I'm sure, confusing. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm thinking, okay, why are we, okay, now I understand. Okay, now I understand. All right. You know, I thought, you know, a week ago I I uh, stopped drinking coffee and I I've been going through withdrawals and I'm thinking, what's happening? <laughs> My no, you're, brain is you're not okay. working. Okay. You're okay. <laughs> All right. You know, another interesting question here. Uh, uh, yes. Is that um, how much cultural integration was there between the Israelites and Egypt? So like how much, yeah. how much common, uh, practice and culture had they developed? I mean, remember they've been there for a long time, right? So that, and, and it's not clear and you got, any of you can correct me if I'm wrong, but to me, it's not clear that there was a strong, a strong enough, uh, tradition and kind of theological framework in the, you know, in the Is Israelite tribes to keep them separate from Egyptian, uh, you know, influence of worship and of the, the philosophies and the ways of thinking that were. Ah, you know, for sure. Right. You know. So, so part of this, I guess that leads to the question of like, you know, part of this is kind of maybe an awkward, uncomfortable transition where people are being ripped out of in a sense, like Moshe is leading a revolution within the Israelite tribes where they're needing to now be ripped out of what they're familiar with, what they know in the worship practices and the, and also it's not just the worship practice, it's the philosophy, it's the way of thinking, it's the way of like relating to the world that comes with those religions and with those uh, pagan practices. Right. So you have to kind of be like, I can just imagine that this is a very uncomfortable, difficult, painful, mental process and emotional of being torn out of what, you know, into something new. And um, that that's part of what Passover was about, was initiating and, in, you know, this, I don't know, what do you guys think about that? Does that make sense? Okay. Wait, so I want to just continue with two things. First of all, according to Jewish tradition, I'm not sure about the question, but in the Jewish tradition, only about 20% of the Israelites, you know, left Egypt. The other 80 kind of assimilated, you know, were too afraid to do anything and just joined the Egyptians. Really? So that's, you know, that's a big percentage. I've never heard that. That's interesting. Uh, it's a rabbinic commentary on the word hamushim alu, uh, which, which has to do with the word, as you know, Gabriel five. So yeah. like one fifth. One fifth. Oh, okay. Actually left. That's a, it's a court of Midrash about it. But, but we also know that perhaps there was the, there were these multitudes, these mixed multitudes of Egyptians who left as well, who joined themselves with the Hebrews right. and the Israelites. So I think there was a, yes, there was a lot of cultural back and forth, um, which, which we, we will feel the, the, the in the desert afterwards. Yeah. But they still had their slave mentality that they were still wanting to go back to Egypt. It's, um, I think you can imagine that at least 200 years, there was a lot of, a lot of issues yeah. as far as Egyptian culture. Yeah, for sure. And just continuing, Gabe, with what you said, what Dina just said now is about slave mentality. So I think if we look at question number two here, right, was freedom from fear of Egyptian oppression, oppressors achieved for the for Israel? I, I think many of the things we see here, you know, they seem like this is to do something against the Egyptians, but actually they are to kind of wake up something within the Jewish people. Meaning, you know, you are you are not part of the Egyptian God. You are not part of their beliefs. You have to do something different. Right. Um, 
you know, from from a like from a like mental, you know, point of view, like way to look on things. You have to be, you have to kind of be different. You have to show them that they are different in order for them to realize they are actually different. And they are not the same because they've been there for generations and generations and generations. I think the question too, fear, like the freedom from fear, I think fear is kind of part of the story all along, you know, there's this constant repetition of like, because I'm just thinking about even when they were just before crossing the Red Sea or the Reed Sea, uh, you know, the Egyptian army coming upon them. I mean, that must've been a fear that they had from the beginning, you know, this idea that, you know, at any point they can just rally up the army and just slaughter or attack us and then enslave us again and drag us off to where we don't want to go. Um, that threat was always there, which I think is why the song of Moses after the drowning in the sea is so significant because that would be a total wake up call to the power of this, of, of the God of Israel, that he can even decimate an army right in front of your eyes. You know, like, so this idea that like when he commands you to do something and to go and to embrace a risky endeavor, um, comes with that, a promise of, of, of wonder working power, which deals with. Yeah. Fear. And I would like to agree that I think this fear really has been all along the story that, uh, something that it took them long to, to get over it. Uh, if they really got over it, because you know the issue with the with Egypt is that uh, the gods were very physical. You know, Pharaoh was physical. He was moving among the people. He was inflicting pain and enslave, enslaving the people. And here they are called by their god now, who has never been among them physically. So they are yet getting introduced to him. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the, the fear that any time Pharaoh might show up, he has his armies, he has his chariots, you know, all of that was with them. And that is why they always kept on desiring to go back instead of moving forward because of the fear that he might show up any time. Yeah. And then again, it was not all of them that was willing to go back. It was just a few that started complaining. So there's... You have to, you know, to me, it seems like there was some that truly believe, you know, in the God of, of Abraham, of Isaac and Jacob. And, but there's some that was still like, kind of like wishy-washy and they would prefer to go back. But to me, it's more of a mental fear than a physical fear. When you want to go back to where you was being physically abused, just because, you know, now you didn't have the onions, the leeks, whatever, you know, the luxury, which Joshua say, oh, they lying. But it's, it's to me, it's just more, okay, I, I'm, I'd rather be where I'm more familiar than to be where I'm not quite familiar, which is in all of us. I think for us to really see the climax of the fear is in the report that was given by the 12. That is really where the climax of the fear, where there are only two who, still stayed bold and who are ready to face their future. But the 10 and the rest of the majority were not ready to face their future. So that is the magnitude of how much fear was in them. And at the end of the day, it was only the two who were able to make it to the land. But the rest that came from Egypt, who continued to cultivate the spirit of fear and timidity and lack of faith, were not able to get into the land. So now you're referring to Joshua and Caleb when they went to yes. counting the... the Yes, because the, there were only two. Joshua and Caleb were the only two who made it to the land. But then and I believe... The younger generation. I and the younger that. generation. But the older generation that feared, that uh, cultivated the spirit of fear, lack of faith, and timidity were not able to make it to the land. They all perished in the wilderness. I believe... That is because of the fear that they continue to harbor within them. Mm. So to me, it's the majority who actually walked in fear. That's a question. What What is uh, traditionally, what's uh, Yonatan or Dina, what, what's the tradition in terms of the kind of just raw breakdown of, of what, what we're talking about? what what do you mean by like that? i mean like uh, what's the i'm just curious about what kind of is the 
the traditional orthodox view of like was it most of the israelites that were kind of crypt in fear and and not functioning in in trust and in kind of faith that would help them rise above the situation or was it a smaller percentage that were just influencing i think unfortunately we have a, we have a we have a we have a proof so to speak you know a few chapters ahead we have the golden golden calf you know most of the israelite you know participated in that um I think that's kind of proof of what was happening, no? Yeah, and I would say that perhaps the tribe of Levi, of Levi, you know, sort of Moshe's people, they were unusual, they were different, and they did not participate. Right, and, but like you said, that, that they were like his family, you know, perhaps they were closer to him, you know, it was easier on them. Um, yeah, but it's it's hard to know. Yeah. You know, with the kind of mob hysteria, it's hard to know what the percentages, yeah, you know, were like. And maybe in a way, maybe we're not supposed and, uh, to fully know, you know. It's like what Jonathan just said, the golden calf, you know, it's like they were recreating Egypt wherever they were. Right. Right. Which gets into, I was just looking at question three, because that's kind of touching on that. You know, is there a message for the worship of, the, of, of God first in your homes as priestly families? Like in kind of in that idea is this is this question is that you need to bring it down to the smallest group the smallest unit and then you know so that the worshiping of the god of israel if that's happening at a family level where it's like a husband and a wife and children then they you know that when that's multiplied by the other families then it becomes very culturally influential so you have to push down and focus at the family level and train the families you know to worship and then from that level it you know the, the the amplification of that of that cultural religious change then influences the whole right yeah i agree and i just want to say paul said before that a lot of those things were kind of anti-egyptians god you know the whole egyptian system so i think this is two meaning first of all you have to kick out from your home all the, you know, misbeliefs and idolatry, idolatry and all those things. Um, that's why you see all those things in the home. First of all, you know, get it out from your house. That's the, that's the first step. Yeah. Um, and then you can move forward with, you know, doing good things. <laughs> Which is interesting, right? Because getting rid of the, the uh, leaven, getting rid of the chametz, that's part of that message. It's like a practical kind of metaphor for getting uh getting the bad things these yeasts these it's these not only metaphor it's part of the same the same idea because the whole idea of bread and yeast is an egyptian idea the egyptians they kind of invented the whole yeast and you know system and you see that in many places in the in the, in the bible for example when you know joseph and his brothers came in then you know he left he he, he ate the bread with them and that was the egyptian it's like a whole, um, the yeast thing, it's not just accidentally about, uh, you know, they didn't have enough time to make a dough and, and make, make the bread rise, because that's obviously not true. They had enough time to, you know, kill the lamb and, you know, cook a full lamb. So obviously they had an hour to let the, the bread, you know, rise if they actually wanted to do it. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. it's, it's more of a, again, it's, it's more of a symbol of a thing. That's interesting. I didn't know that that yeah. the yeast was associated with uh, Egyptian yes. culture. Associated very hardly, not on, not only in the Bible, also in archaeology and all of those places. It's it's very associated with the Egyptian. Uh... That's very interesting because also I had heard about how beer was a very common Egyptian beverage, and that comes from yeast. Believe for well. the same reasons. Yeah, the True. yeast is part of what makes beer bubbly and makes it um, right. you know ferment. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting. That's news for me. That's new information. I'm really happy you shared that. That's really cool. Yes, thank you, Jonathan. Jonathan, yeah. that's really good. Yeah. My wife is an archaeologist, so I have all these archaeologic things in my head. Ah, yeah, because you're the first. <laughs> you're the first person I've ever heard share that uh, that idea of the yeast uh, association with the Egyptian culture, which then changes the idea here, right? A little bit. Then you see that 
you know, this commandment of getting the yeast out of the house and not eating bread with yeast, it's like almost a preparation to divorce you from a culture, to divorce you from a, yeah, yeah from a dietary culture yeah. in a way. That's very interesting. Yeah. And yeah, not only for us Christians, it represents uh, getting rid of our sins, being washed by, you know, by the blood, right? Yeah, metaphorically. So, the, but the, yeah. what's interesting though is there's a parallel to what Jonathan just said about this Egyptian thing because the idea of sin, in, you know, in, in, in the Christian uh, context of this, that you're getting out of the culture of sin. It's, it's very, very parallel because when the Christian yes. communities were growing, for example, in Asia, which was Turkey, it was filled with pagan idolatry, filled with all kinds of temple prostitution, um, all kinds of weird, like, you know, blood cults and weird, weird stuff that would be very countercultural to a Jewish way of, of living in the world and of not, not doing these bizarre pagan practices. So part of getting sin out of your life is getting those observances out of your life, getting that idol worship out of your life, the blood stuff, like where they would eat blood and they would do all kinds of weird things. And then the sexual immorality, those, a lot of those things were associated with worshiping gods, right? Exactly like the golden calf. So, you know, it's the metaphor, even though in modern Christianity, we would probably focus on a very spiritualized concept. It actually had very, very practical lifestyle challenges and changes in the in the early context of you know of the christian development so it's just very interesting that this idea that our culture might be totally normal you know integrated just like with the chametz with the yeast and and worshiping the gods of egypt you're actually being called out of your culture you're being called out of this place into a new place that is according to god's law that's according to god's instructions you know and which are like a parent teaching a child to live well um you know and so it's interesting that that parallel is there hmm. freedom from fear is another thing freedom like this idea of freedom that word is a very tricky word because that you know is that something you actually want do you actually want to be free or would you prefer to stay a slave? And that applies to both like lifestyle habits, behaviors, un unhealthy things that you do, as well as, you know, in a greater sense, like the spiritual freedom to be free from oppression of gods and paganism, uh, which is sort of like the same thing. It's just kind of a different, different layer of kind of understanding, I think. I think a couple of weeks ago, we spoke a little bit about that. I don't remember exactly which Parsha, but you said, you know, to get, you know, free from their from their fear so we didn't actually get you know the freedom from the fear we just replaced it by kind of in, instead of being you know fearing the egyptian they kind of started fearing the you know the jewish god right um yeah and i think that was kind of you know the reasons for all those complaints and you know things after because if you're doing everything but only because of fear then every little you know thing you can do differently you are trying to do it differently if you're not doing it from like you know true belief or true like from something within you yeah. it's just from the fear right so as soon as moses is is you know is not to be seen so you you know you try to make a different god for yourself fear is kind of an interesting thing right because it's a human experience that you can't really get away from you can't just like wave a magic wand and not be exposed to fear in your life. Like you sometimes feel fear when you don't want to, you'll feel fear even when you want to be brave or when you want to like push through and do, let's say the right thing in a situation. Sometimes fear is like a companion that you have to learn to wrestle with and overcome. Uh, you can't just make it disappear. Uh, I, I, I think in a way sometimes that you're gonna, just like with the Israelites, like they had to confront fear at every step of the journey. Um, it wasn't just something they could just, they could be got, gotten rid of. It's like an ongoing fight. It's a battle that needs to be fought. And I think that, you know, we can relate to that as well, that anytime you're dealing with change in your life, uh, anytime you're dealing with powerlessness in your life, there might be areas of where you don't feel like you have power to do something or change something that'll create fear in you. Your response will be usually to your first response often will be to fear. And then you have to learn how to submit that fear to the fear of God where it's like you choose basically a higher, better fear in a sense. Um, 
that confronts and deals with 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 fears that really aren't productive and aren't useful if that makes if that makes sense you seen as yeah. good at fear <laughs> go ahead Devin. no i was saying so again basically there's some good there's some good fear there's also some bad fear yeah but how do you how when do you choose when do you get to pick which one is good and which one is bad how do you have to That's turn the good fear versus the bad fear? I'd say it's a good question. I think if I can say that if you're able to identify that the fear that you're feeling is uh, is for you to grow into what you need to do or to grow in the better knowledge of God, you know, um, identifying that fear will help you to to conquer that fear, knowing why the purpose of it that you're sensing. Well, fear. I experienced that yesterday, actually, a couple of times. Well, fear also can so. be, I don't know, Justin, if this is part of what you're saying, but fear can also be a belief in the negative. So sometimes when you're saying yeah. I'm dealing with my fear, what you actually have to confront is not the emotion of fear. You have to confront the belief that you have. <clears throat> the belief, yeah. the thing that you're believing yeah. that, that expresses itself yeah. in an emotion of fear. That's and right. Then, and, and that's why like yeah. this idea of, you know, of believing, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, at the root of the word of amen or, um, I mean, like to believe something, uh, is that's actually really critical and even, even completely non-religious, uh, clinical science uh, has very much gone that direction. You know, there's a very, very popular form of treatment called uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. And mm -hmm. a lot of the treatment approaches in cognitive behavioral therapy is actually observe your emotion and then look at the belief that's beneath the emotion and what is it you believe. And then you can deal with a belief. You can't really make an emotion go away. You just chase it with a little stick and it just keeps, you know, running around you in circles. But the belief that's generating that emotion, you can deal with that. And you can reason with it and you can, you know, you can interact with it almost like with a personality, which is interesting. Yeah, that's a very good point, Gabriel. I just want to mention again that the word in Hebrew really is more trust than trust. belief and, and trust. Thank you. Really helps as far as fear. Mm -hmm. It's yes. really almost the opposite of fear, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Which, yes. Which then yes. becomes like trusting in is a, that goes like a really good rabbit hole, uh, you know, deep kind of idea, right? Is it like when you, what is it you're trusting in? You mm -hmm. know, um, what tools have you developed in your life that you trust? Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. maybe those tools are failing you when you live in fear constantly, right? If you feel, if you're living in a state of negative emotion. Uh, right. You, yeah. What is your trust pattern? Who are you trusting and what are you trusting? Big questions. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Should we scroll down just to look again at the um, the yeah. bonus questions? Yeah, let's take a yes. look. Let's do that. Yeah. We sort of touched on one already when we were talking about these patterns, yes. of the parallels of uh, of the Passover in the Jewish tradition and in the Christian perspective. Um, you know, this replacement question in question one here uh, is actually very interesting because. And I think it's actually true about Zionism with with Judaism too. Like the idea of Zionism coming into the picture. So when you bring into like the the idea of like the call uh, in a practical, tangible way, where the land of Israel, for example, is part of the Jewish experience, it's part of Judaism, right? And I think as Christians see that, and then also start to see through that lens as well, it actually helps highlight a lot of these issues, these questions, because this Passover, you know, uh, the, the Jewish Passover is really part of this whole Exodus story. And then remembering the Exodus story and training the generations to remember the Exodus story. And that's also, I think, a part of the Zionistic, you know, idea of, well, why are we in the land? Why are we here? Why do we have this temple? Why, how, where were we before, right? You're training and remembering for the sake of, of passing on the um the core identity of but it also informed not only jewish 
and Israel. But I think the whole Passover story really informed, I know, American history very much, that yes. the ones who, yes. who came over to America and saw themselves as the new Israelites. They named their cities. They, they believed that, um, you know, and then in the Civil War, there was the, the Moses, you know, um, underground Harriet Tubman, who they called Moses. There was this, you know, let my people go. There's a, in a at least in American history, but I think in many in of British, the revolutions, in British a well. lot of that kind of feeling of the we're anti-tyranny um, th that we learn really from this the, from this great Exodus story of uh, in the Bible. Yeah, okay. Dina, if I'm if I'm continuing your thought, then I'm going to say that in the American uh, history. The turkey is replacing, you know, um, you know, the Koban Pesach and Thanksgiving is replacing, you know, the Seder kind of uh, situation. <laughs> yeah, or or Sukkot, perhaps. We, we're going to be leaving in 41 seconds, but I think that was a really terrific. I was going uh, to can I, can I just say something to, uh, 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 yeah, electricity went quickly. out, that's why I'm off. But uh, to the question about good fear and bad fear, I believe that good fear is linked with obedience and bad fear is linked with uh, the disobedience. And most of the idol gods, are, what they normally use is really bad fear. And God just requires obedience from us. And then we will be linked with him. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just in time. Yeah. We're able yeah. to say that. All right. See you guys in the big yeah. room. Thank you. Paul. Recording in progress.